this is the Charisma Quotient. I'm your host, Kim Seltzer, a dating and makeover expert, where I will help you build confidence, make connections, and find love from the outside in. I will never forget about this woman I worked with. And she was approaching dating as if she was studying, I kid you not, to get her PhD. (laughs) Before every date, check this out, she would scour the man's profile and make sure he had all the qualifications she was looking for. She would highlight red flags and would then write up a list of concerns she had about her future with him. And this wasn't just a list of non-negotiables. And that's something that, you know, I encourage people to do. No, this was a complete research project she was taking on for her dissertation on love. And the story she was going to write was that it was going to be different than her ex. So being a therapist, of course, we reviewed her her history and realized that she always looked for love this way. She always was in her head, not wanting to repeat the past and attract the unavailable men that she was attracting. She was worried about the future and what life would look like, and if he fit the bill, that she completely lost the present. She lost the moment and really connecting with men. And on top of it all, she wasn't even flirting. And you know how I feel about that. So you see, she was waiting to see if the guy met the qualifications. And it was only then that she would quote unquote, turn it on. So I told her something pretty simple that blew her away and that she didn't even think about. I said to her, did you know that men don't think in fairy tales? and the outcome of the future when you first meet them. And she was baffled. I mean, this whole time she figured all men thought like her. And I said, they just want to feel that connection, that physical attraction and have fun and like the way they feel around you. And so then, of course, I put her on this dating regimen that consisted of, number one, no lists, Number two, not getting attached to the outcome. And number three, practice connecting. And how I taught her to do this was, of course, using my magic formula for attraction. I call it the three Fs. And for those of you who don't know what it is, it's very simple yet really effective. It's having fun and flirting. And that's all I wanted her to do. And then I told her to come home each day and write down three things she learned about something that night. So it could have been about her date. It could have been about herself, a restaurant. I didn't care. But the only thing that she was to focus on was that night. And poof, like magic, she started creating attraction on these dates. And she had a ton of men after her. And at that point, she was ready to decide who she wanted to move on with. She finally learned how to pace things out. And there were some big lessons also that she learned. First of all, that there are differences in the way that men and women date. Also, how her own triggers and issues were preventing her from finding a healthy relationship. And most importantly, how to focus and love herself. So when it comes to the initial stages of dating, and there are many, you know, it often feels like a whirlwind. There's a lot of emotions, there's romance, crazy, amazing sex, and men and women have different experiences. Why? Because falling in love for a man is not the same as it is for a woman. And men and women are wired differently. We know this, you know, overall, look, women are more emotive in intellectualized love, right? They get kind of cerebral. We we start thinking about the storybook, the boyfriend, the husband, the picket fence. We have that dream, you know, when we first meet a guy. Men, on the other hand, tend to need that initial attraction to be open to getting to know the woman who they ultimately will fall for. And they're just more simple in the way they think. I really admire this about men. Honestly, sometimes I I wish I was a man because it is a lot more fun when you think of it this way. They just want to see if they're sexually attracted to the woman. She's cool. They're having fun. And, you know, if they want to see her again, this guy once dated said it best when he explained the differences. He said, basically, 
If you show up naked or something sexy on, oh, and if you have Chinese food in your hand, I'm in. <laughs> now, I'm painting a much, much more simplistic and general description of gender differences in dating and relationships. But for this episode, I wanted to bring in the pro for a juicy discussion on specifically how men and women think and date differently. You might have heard of him. You know, the guy who talks about being from different planets. He is the author of the most well-known and trusted relationship books of all times. Men are from Mars, women are from Venus. USA Today listed his book as one of the top 10 most influential books of the last quarter century. He has written over 20 books. His most recent book is Beyond Mars and Venus. His Mars Venus book series has forever changed the way men and women view their relationships. John helps men and women better understand and respect their differences in both personal and professional relationships. His approach combines specific communication techniques with healthy nutritional choices. I love that. That create the brain and body chemistry for lasting healthy happiness and romance. He has appeared all over the place. Oprah, Dr. Oz Show, Today, CBS in the Morning, Good Morning America. He's been profiled in Time, Forbes, USA Today, People. Welcome, Dr. John Gray. Hi. Loved your intro. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I love that you are here. <laughs> and I think I told you off the air, I just, I've been... Um, a fan for so long, and really, you've inspired you know me in helping my clients, and recommend you often. But you know what I didn't realize about you, and it wasn't until I started reading like your backstory, your bio. You have an amazing journey that kind of shaped what you do. I would love, I'd love to hear more about that because I think that kind of thrusted you into what you're doing right now, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I have a, I, I think. A very different perspective than most people, so it helped give me more insight. I, I grew up with five brothers, so there were six boys, so I really knew boys. And then, very, I love women. I uh, had a great relationship with my <laughs> mom as well, and had lots of sex as a teenager. Uh, but I'm really about going. I'm kind of an extremist now. I'm kind of extremely moderate. Uh, but um, as a teenager, I got really, really high, but you go really, really low. And mm -hmm. that was around the time of the Beatles. And they went to India to study meditation. They said you could get high on meditation and not have a crash. So I then <laughs> went off to be with the Maharishi, who was their guru. And I lived with him for nine years. Uh, I was, you know, I went to full extent. I, I was his personal assistant. I mimicked him. I became a celibate monk, Hindu monk. Uh, and so that meant no sex from 19 to 27. So it oh. was... Oh my God. How did you do that? <laughs> uh, well, I meditated a lot. I used to meditate yeah. at least five to 15 hours a day. Uh, it, and med if you're a master of meditation, it's like sex. I mean, it's ecstatic. I mean, I can... Wow. Uh, so I, I, I found through meditation, and I was an extremist, okay? You know, I used to fast for a month at a time. I'd go without talking. I created altered states naturally, but the outcome of all of that was a great 20s. I loved it. I never masturbated the whole time. The energy went up. So I know the power of not ejaculating. Uh, it does have extra benefits if men learn how to orgasm without ejaculating. I highly recommend that, but that's not the subject we're focusing on now. Um, <laughs> I'll be it very uh, interesting though. It is. It is. It's actually the secret of lasting passion. My wife and I have always had great sex and we'll always have great sex because we understand that. But go beyond that. It's outside the bedroom, which is so important. And here I am at 28 years old. I'm, my brother was bipolar and, I, and meditation didn't fix that. So I, mm. I left being a monk. Yeah, it was a real bummer. And um, went out to California to study psychology. And as a psychologist, I learned that I had a talent, uh, which is from all those years of meditation, I really found the happiness within. You know, I'm a very centered oh, person. Yeah. Uh, and so when I got with Bonnie, my wife, and other women before that, really women were like from another planet. I knew men inside and out. I, I was in a place of non-judgmental awareness, unconditional love. Meditation mm -hmm. helps you find an inner happiness so that when you're not empty, you don't judge other people. You're kind of more curious. So I really felt like I was a visitor from another planet when I would interact with Bonnie. 
And, and instead of like making her wrong or trying to fix her or change her, I didn't need to. Uh, I was so sufficient in myself, but I would ask questions. And it was curious to me. And constantly her interpretation of me was just completely off. And my interpretation of her was completely off. And as a counselor, the same thing happened again. You know, I had eight hours of women every day oh my talking, talking about their challenges in relationships with men. And I would just mm-hmm. help them understand, but that's not what he's thinking. That's not what he's doing. And when he does that, he doesn't know what you need. And so it was learning that our instinctive reactions tend to be what we want, what we need, and we expect our partners to know that. So at a time when it was extremely politically uh, not acceptable, and it's not even today, I began talking about these differences. And people felt in one session with me, uh, their relationships dramatically got better. So I then over the next 10 years refined down my message to like eight basic distinctions between men and women that make a big difference in improving the dating process, relationships, great sex. Mm. And, and and certainly life is complicated and it doesn't eliminate all problems, but it helps couples to be on the same side when they're facing challenges. And, and instead of problems making us uh, become more separate, problems and challenges become opportunities to grow closer in love. And I'll, I'll, I'll just one more statement on how that looked for me. Yeah. It, it, my wife really was a source of major wisdom in this whole process because I didn't know anything about women basically until I listened to her. But we were having great, great sex around sex. I think is really, really important as well. Uh, so important for sustaining passion and love and all that. But you have to have the skills. But anyway, so I had the skills. I used to teach classes on sex. After I'd been a celibate for nine years, all I thought about was having sex and I had lots of sex. And when I traveled around having lots of sex, I would interview women before I had sex with them. I'd say, look, I've been a monk for nine years. I don't know anything about women. Teach me. So it was really Ah. wonderful. And it was just an easy way to learn. And women were happy to share because it was like a different context. And then I, my first workshops were called Enlightened Sexuality, uh, where I would just have men and women uh, in the classes talk about their sexual experiences and what they liked and what they didn't like, because it was so helpful for me. Many times, many women just don't talk that openly about sex and what they like, what they don't like, and maybe Mm -hmm. some learn from other people about what's even more fun. So that that became a foundation for, you know, learning about the differences between men and women, because certainly in the bedroom, we're so different, and then expanded into relationships. So anyway, about seven years into my marriage with Bonnie, um, I was saying, wow, that sex was so great. It was like better than, it was like as good as in the beginning, as good as in the beginning. And Mm. she said, oh, it was much better. And I asked her, why was it better? And she said, because in the beginning, we didn't really know each other. Yeah. But now you've seen the best of me and the worst of me, and you still adore me. That's, and I just, that, that awakened me to begin noticing that, yeah, it's the love along with the sex that made it so ecstatic. And prior to that, you, you, you can have this ecstatic sexual experience, but it doesn't have the richness and the depth of a, of a long-term relationship. So I, I just, I, I feel so fortunate to have learned all this. And unfortunately, most people don't have that, that grounding in their mm-hmm. sense of I'm fulfilled within myself. I don't need to change my partner in any way. And when I'm not feeling loving towards them, I need to change myself rather than try to change them. And yes. then, and then you have a you can have a sustained loving relationship. But we 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 sort of become so ungrounded in our source of happiness inside. We start looking to the other person to do it all. And I loved in your intro when you're talking about even in the dating process, mm. not to keep looking to how this person's going to fulfill me but to mm-hmm. connect with them and be responsible to have a positive experience, which, you know, the way I say it is, you know, your goal should not be to find the right person, although that's a long-term intention, but the goal in, in that immediate situation is to create a positive experience for yourself. You, we are responsible for our experiences. I mean, the outer world comes to us, but how we react to it, respond to it and so forth has a lot to do with us, much more to do with us and how we deal with it. So if you create a series of positive dating experiences, it's kind of like a snowball 
and you just start noticing and attracting and bringing in more and more of what you're looking for and wanting. But you've got to, you can't just go from that was a crummy date to this is just my ideal partner. You, exactly. You wanna, exactly. You, you, you build on it. You start creating a positive uh, experience. If you're a woman, you're realizing that, well, this guy wasn't right, but we had fun here. We did this. I like that. I didn't like that. And just constantly exploring and learning what makes you happy as opposed to depending on someone else so much, but just enjoying the process while you're seeing life is never perfect. No man is ever going to provide everything you want and need. That's a fantasy. But you can find a partner who will allow you to grow and be all that you can be, which the happiness ultimately comes from inside. I love this. There's so many just gold nuggets. I'm like jotting notes down <laughs> furiously as you're talking. That relates so much to, you know, my work with people, but also just us as humans. You know, one of the key things that you said and is so important, and I love because your journey actually spoke to that, is coming from a place of curiosity and connection rather than, which really helps people stay present, right? Like I always say, you know, as we get older and we start dating and maybe dating after divorce or whatnot, and we've had kind of baggage that we've collected and it gets heavier and heavier that we, it really weighs us down. So we're, like I said in the beginning, we're so focused and worried and fearful of you know, creating that again in the past. And then we get so anxious about what's going to happen and forecast to the future that we lose that connectivity and curiosity. And so it's such a good reminder just with your journey and, you know, everyone listening is that when you do that, it creates more of that positive experience. And and to me, that's how I define confidence, by the way. A lot of people, you know, define it differently, but I define confidence as experience, right? Because I've been, I was married for uh, what, over 10 years. And it's like the spaceship landed and the door went up and I'm looking ahead of me at all these aliens called men. And I had no idea how to speak the language, right? Like that was kind of my... I almost had to relearn it at, at this age, which was different than when I was in my 20s doing toga parties in a, my fraternity house, right? And so I, I'm so interested in, because you talk about phases in dating. I do too, but I like how you broke it down. And I thought it'd be really fun to have a conversation of what the differences are in the genders as people are going out there either dating again or, or maybe for the first time, right? Yes, yes. Well, it's a big subject, you know. Mars Venus on a date is a big book I wrote, but the but yeah. we can simplify it down at five stages of the dating process. When your intention is to get married, okay, that's uh, they're there even if your intention is not. But the fifth stage yeah. is is getting married. So the first is attraction. Uh, we'll go into that. The second is uncertainty. It's inevitable that if you really hit the, if you become really really attracted to somebody and they're the one, then certainly everybody goes to the different degrees of uncertainty. And the challenge there is when people are uncertain, they think, oh, if I'm uncertain, then this can't be the right person. But the truth is, it's whenever anything really good comes along, it pushes buttons inside of us and we wonder, gee, you know, do I really deserve it? Is it gonna last? Will it last? And we start getting sort of more critical uh, judging and questioning. But if you make it through, we'll talk about how to do that stage two, you get to stage three where you feel like, wow, this person's the one or maybe mm -hmm. they're the one. It's still a maybe they're the one, but that's commitment. And you give the chance of the relationship to flower without bringing other people into it, meaning you're sexually monogamous at that point, at least by that time. And you're in this committed relationship. Then there's challenges that come up then, you know, particularly the most common one for men is that they feel like, okay, now I can relax. And oh, they do less. Yes. <laughs> and, yes. And, and when he does less, women will start to do more. And that really throws it off. Uh, then if you That's if so you true. make it through commitment and he doesn't do less, it's kind of like he feels like I won the race. Now I can sit back and watch. And she feels like, oh, now we can really grow together. And she starts giving more, thinking he'll give more. So there's a lot of challenges in that stage. And But one, if you make it through that stage and you're still growing <laughs> in love together, then what happens is stage four is real intimacy. And mm -hmm. real intimacy is where you feel very safe uh, 
to open up to this person like they, they could be the one you share your life with and you can just open your heart fully and they go very very deep inside of you and then that triggers what we can say is childhood issues old conditioning you start oh, yeah. having kind of irrational responses to things like overreacting feeling annoyed irritated <laughs> and mm-hmm. uh, insecurities come up because that's what love will do love will bring up the depths of your issues to work through and that's where you need to have some knowledge of ownership of your stuff versus your partner it's so easy to project onto them the cause of your unhappiness or to become you know hyper pr- pr- picky are demanding. And that's when we need to you make sure in stage four, when we're going to be really, really intimate, open up, that we're not depending on our partners for our happiness, but we have an outlet, which is other, we have a life separate from them mm-hmm. so that, you know, there's an ebb and flow of the intimacy. And I'll explain that too, if we have time. And then once you have stage four, you get through that, you, you wake up one day and you go with complete confidence. This is the one for me then you don't get married, you get engaged. And I really like engagement periods for people, uh, particularly when they're younger. You know, if you're older, you don't have a lot more time to live. <laughs> so go ahead and go for it. Uh, maybe even after the first date. But, right, right, right. Uh, but when you're younger and you're going to build a life together, if it's that kind of a marriage, maybe you have children or whatever, then, then you want to give yourself a good nine months to a year to be engaged so that mm. this is the easiest time of your marriage because you're not making decisions uh, on what kind of house, what kind of furniture, where you're going to put things, how you're going to spend money. You know, that becomes gradual during that time as you start exploring it. And because there'll be differences that come up, but there's not the pressure when those differences come up that I've already signed the contract and this is my partner for the rest of my life. But there's that feeling of, uh, uh, of freedom. And at the same time, your love is, you have no, you don't have this big history as well. So you can work through challenges without, without always feeling like, um, I'm stuck in this relationship and you have so much more love at that time. And I really insist, I, I encourage for women to make sure they put forth all their wishes and needs and how they like things during that time, because that's when your negotiating power is the greatest. Ah, Just, yeah. uh, Quite often, women during the engagement or prior to that time will postpone expressing their true wishes, wants, needs, and so forth, and 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 just love the man, thinking that once we get married, then he'll change and give her more. Uh, you don't want to think that way because mm. generally, when you once you're married to a certain extent, and this can change, of course, with good skills, he feels like okay, I don't have to do anything more. <laughs> you know, <laughs> who, who I am is loved and accepted just the way I am. And then when you ask for more at that point, the man feels kind of ripped off. Wait a second, you know, uh, this is who I was when you married me. Why do you want me to change? And yes, yes. No, you know what I hear? Because then the women say, you know, he changed so much. He wasn't like that when we first met. Like I I, I hear that all the time. So is that kind of what you're talking about? well it's it's really that that's that I didn't mention that, but that mm-hmm. is also a, a thing that happens. Where's the man I fell in love with? Yeah, that he will tend to do less, and that that's that's basically stage three when men do less. And what okay. women have to learn at that point is how to ask for more without demanding. See, the whole thing is to realize it's in it's in the nature of men uh, once they've sort of earned love to become lazy. That's just who they are. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so what what you have to do is understand how the mechanics of motivating a man to continue doing more and more without giving the message that he's not good enough, without giving the message that he should change. And So maybe like um, wearing some sexy laundry and showing up with Chinese food, would that work? (laughs) <laughs> you know, what you, I say yes, but, right. uh, but what, what, what you have to Just know simple. is that, yeah. you know, 30 years ago, that was what Red Book would say to women. Yeah. And, it, and it did, in the long run, it didn't work out because there's other factors that need to take place. Okay. So you show up in lingerie uh, with Chinese food. You are the perfect woman for me. Okay. So mm-hmm. now, but what just happened is I got my way and now I go on vacation again. It's kind of like, okay, I, I, if she wants me that much to do that, then I'm doing a really good job. So I don't have to do much for a while. Ah, uh, see, okay. It's okay. kind of a, it's a paradox. Okay. And mm-hmm. the, the parrot, and there's an answer to this, but the idea is 
if you appreciate and delight um, to be delighted with a man is the greatest gift you can give and putting on lingerie uh showing that you're interested in having sex with him basically says i won the lottery to the man Mm -hmm. Uh, that's the the bell hits the top i have achieved my goal now i have permission to relax and do less okay that's always going to be the case for men i made a lot of money now i'm going vacation I, i gave her this great uh I provided something for her so she wants to have sex with me. That's the greatest thing you can ever give to a man is to have sex with him because you enjoy having sex with him because you're turned on to him and you want to have sex with him. That's very different from showing up uh, and not really wanting to have sex with him, but wanting to please him. See, there's a, there's a mm. distinction there. If you do anything yes. to please a man, he tends to will do less. Yes. Uh, if you, if you do, th- now here's the paradox. If he has pleased you so much that you now want to have sex with him, that's the ideal. But once again, that says to him, you did a good job. Now you can rest. And men have this limitation in their thinking, which is kind of like, I did it once. I don't have to do it again. It's kind of of like, I want to have, I want to make a lot of money so I can retire, which is unfortunate programming inside of men. I will Mm -hmm. never retire. That's how you die as a man is when you stop being of service. So. How do you keep a man motivated if you're giving him lots of love? Well, women will do this in the beginning. They'll give him lots of love. That's at level three. Yeah. They'll revert back to where he feels successful. He becomes passive. And so then what women will do is try to love him more, give more to him than he's giving to you is a disaster. Right. I'll say that again. When you give more to a man than he's giving to you, he will give you less and less and less. It's These are hard ideas to get at first. But if you give him what he'd earned, then he will give more because he's getting well paid, so to speak. Imagine I go to a job and you pay me twice if I do nothing. (laughs) Then I'll do nothing more and more. So let's say a guy, so that's when you give more to a man than he's doing for you, he will do less. But if you give him a lot of love for what he did do, he will also do less for a little bit of time. Uh So then you have to motivate him. That's what women have to get in mind. See, women don't need motivation. If you give love to women, they just are so motivated to give back. Yes. Uh, They they feel guilty not giving back. Where, you know, a a fun example of this is a bunch of women get together and and one woman gets up to clean up the dishes. The other women have to get up and help too. Otherwise, they feel guilty. Uh, But you get a bunch of guys together and one guy starts cleaning up. The rest of the guys will just sit there and feel fine. They figure it's his turn. You know, there's no part of men that has to be so reciprocal as women. So this is a, unless a man has developed his female side. You know, though, can I just interrupt for a second? I'm thinking about the different stages, right? And often like when clients come to me, they're, they're coming to me in the first stage, you know, they're just even trying to understand, you know, how to create attraction, how to, you know, get that chemistry going. Um, and, and what I find actually, what's interesting, what you're saying is that a lot of times women mistakenly don't let the men earn them enough, even in the first stage, right? And right. So that's Absolutely. Part Absolutely. of that flirting and the courtship. And I always tell women, you know, it's a man's pleasure to earn you. Like, It is something that he wants to do. You know, it's very primal. And so I think, and I always tell people this, what, you know, what you do and how you show up from the minute you say hello really does set a precedent for the rest of the relationship in a lot of ways. I mean, given some of the points that you're saying too. So yes, yes. no, it starts in attraction. Yeah. Let me just finish that one little thing, although you brought it in, it starts right with the first date. It's that tendency of trying to earn a man's love is going in the wrong direction. A man needs to earn a woman's love. And if she is insecure inside, she will work too hard trying to earn his love. Now, there's nothing wrong with being, you know, presentable and being friendly and nice and so forth. But if you're doing it more than him, that's the thing. It's about balance. And and it should be, he needs to earn your affection. That's what it's about. And you need to let him know that you're giving him an opportunity to earn your affection. And in stage three, when you're a bit more intimate and you're more close, you're spending time together, you're in a monogamous relationship, the way that looks is you show up in your negligee and you have (laughs) Chinese food and you have great (laughs) sex and you know that he's going to be a little passive for a few days. And then you start asking him to do stuff. You plan dates, for example. And this is how you plan dates. Ooh, I like this. Yeah. Men get get very lazy. They just figure, okay, Friday night, uh, you want to get some... (laughs) 
Chinese, Chinese food. food. <laughs> <laughs> Watch a Netflix yeah. movie and that's it, you know, and that's, yeah. that's okay sometimes. It's okay. So, but what romance is and what women need that men don't know, okay, is that women need to anticipate going out on a date, doing something out of the normal and dressing up, looking pretty, maybe yes. wearing some of her jewelry, wearing a pretty dress that she wore, wearing something so that, and, and wearing nice underwear underneath so she knows he's going to get it later. It's all oh, very exciting to women. Music to my ears. Okay, ladies, I did not tell John to say this. This is like, you are preaching what I practice and teach. I love this. I love this. Well, because here's the thing, and I'm just going to do a pushback because I think women get lazy too. To your point about this whole dressing, like we forget to date our partner again in this stage. And so while we're eating Chinese food in front of the TV, we have our sweats on and we forget about the whole aspect of the courtship and what turned us on. And dressing up is part of the program. You know, it's, it's our costume, if you will, that gives us that sexy confidence that makes that first impression, that femininity that you feel when you're in that dress and, and men appreciate that. So thank you for saying that. Oh, it makes such, such a difference. So how to set that up? You just yeah. gave women the wisdom that they have their side of it. There needs to be that anticipation, that dressing up, the feeling that, the anticipation that gives her the confidence that she is beautiful, that she's sexy, that she's attractive. It, it both goes both ways. Now, what he needs to do to support her in that, what she can do to get him to support her in that. Remember, this is all about motivating men as opposed to, okay, men are just supposed to uh, do this. You, they will respond, but you have the power as women. So what you do is you have a conversation, let's say a week in advance is generally a good time, like say on Saturday or Sunday, you're having a conversation and you mention to him three things that you would love to do next week. And he nice. should pick, he should pick. So you're giving him three things that whatever he picks, he will be successful at. Because the whole key to dating is that he feels he's successful in providing happiness for you. Yeah. That's his thing. Men often give up even planning dates because women will go, <laughs> women will go, and they innocently do this. Oh, that food mm -hmm. was terrible. I can't believe we had to pay so much for it. You know, <laughs> who would go to that restaurant again? And two women could go to that restaurant and bond over talking how bad it was. Yeah. But women don't always know that if a man is taking you on a date. That's when he is most vulnerable. That's when he's taking off his clothes. He is sharing his heart with you, wanting to have a good effect for you. And so it's not like you have to not be truthful. It's just be sensitive and considerate in terms of how you respond and try to focus primarily on what does work, what you do like. And I remember noticing this with my wife. Okay, Bonnie. So she, she worked really hard at this. Okay, so I took her to this movie. And, and this is in the beginning. I'm trying to impress her. And I thought she'd like the movie. Clearly, even I, with lack of empathy, although I did have some empathy, could sense this was not a movie that she would like. You know, it was, oh, wow. I didn't like it either. But I'm like dragging it out. And I'm panicking guys inside that she, that she liked this movie, not how bad was it for her, whatever. So as we're walking out of the movie theater, I said to her, well... Because it's kind of like a, if you're insecure about your looks, you might say, how do I look tonight? Well, I was insecure about the movie. So I said, well, what'd you think about the movie? And she goes, she pauses. <laughs> and then she says, you know, that sunset scene <laughs> that was so beautiful. <laughs> and I went, oh, thank girl. you. Thank you. Because, you know, when, when a man provides something for a woman, that's him. You know, yeah. it's like I wrote the movie, I directed it. And so when she said the sunset scene, my reaction emotionally inside is, yep, I only filmed that movie. I didn't write it or direct it. And oh my God, but I love, it. It. What's so great. I love how she still made you feel good, you know, that's, and that, that's it. That's and it. I always say to be, you know, and this is a, gosh, this could be a whole other podcast. Maybe I'll have you back on in terms of just femininity and the roles and, and how they're really merging these days. You know, it's like the caveman comes home after a long day of hunting and brings the lady a piece of meat. And literally so many women today are slamming the door and say, oh, sorry, I already have one in the fridge. Like, that's not the point. <laughs> you know, of course you might have the meat. Of course you could probably hunt on your own at this point. But 
to, you know, what you said is so important and how I see it playing out. So, you know, on, on that first phase, the attraction factor, and as we move through the continuum, I, I have some women who overdo it, like we were talking about before, and, and, and they don't let the men earn them. But then the, the flip side, because I have these archetypes, these dating archetypes that I talk about, and one is the chief, where she, she's the one that picks the restaurant, picks up the guy, says what she wants, you know, like not letting or just, you know, giving to the man or even being able to receive. And I think that's also a big gender difference that I'm finding in today's age. Well, that, that is a formula for disaster. What right? happens is every man has a tendency to be lazy, just to put... Now, another yeah. way of looking at it, here's a complimentary way of putting at it, is that men have a gene and we can call it the efficiency gene. It means never do anything you don't have to do. This, this word, <laughs> I have to do, <laughs> yeah. is something that triggers inside of men masculinity. When women, when women are stressed, you'll see this when women are stressed as a therapist, their mind is filled with, I have to do this, I have to uh-huh. do this, I have to do this. That throws women out of balance as opposed to I get to, I love to, I enjoy doing, I like to do. So those kind of internal responses to life actually generate peace and happiness and love and femininity in women. Whereas that feeling I have to do, that Mm -hmm. generates masculinity. That brings men back into their power. It also brings women into their power, which is good. Yeah. It's not balanced with I get to, I love to, I enjoy doing. Everything now today is about balance. And women are, the pressure on women and the freedom for women goes easily to the masculine side. And for Mm -hmm. men, it goes easily to the feminine side. And when a man goes, oh, I don't have to do that. I just want to relax. I want to enjoy. I want to go with the flow. Where do you want to go? Where do you want to take me? Oh, we're going to have sex too. This is unbelievably great. He'll <laughs> like that. He likes it, but he doesn't bond with her. Hmm. They bond with what they have accomplished and achieved. That's what makes you say you're mine as opposed to, sure, I'll happy to you know, feed me some more. Give me what I want. Give me what I like. He does, that doesn't cause a bonding in men it actually weakens men from being on their masculine side. And again, I'm being extreme here, but you have to talk a little bit on the extremes in order to make the point. Absolutely. There there is a balance of give and take in a relationship. It's not that she can't plan a date occasionally, but it needs to make sure that he's doing more of that stuff. But it's not like he's just doing it all either. She has to let him know what she'd like, as opposed to this sort of naive thing that he'll figure it out. You know, it's like an right. in, infant state of her as he's supposed to know everything and arrange it and do everything. Not that that can't happen occasionally. You know, I try to go for, you know, one time a year organizing something that's magnificent and wonderful without her having to ask for it or know about it or whatever Aww. surprise. You know, that's a special thing. But you can't do that every week. <laughs> right. But then it's not a surprise. <laughs> that's what makes it special. So that's Yeah. 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 Oh my God. I, I like, I could go on and on with this conversation. And I think that, you know, what, what you said is it's kind of a recipe for disaster and in, in what we're seeing now where, I mean, I, I feel like, you know, gone are the days of the my fair lady, right? Like we can't go back in time with, with this, but we also right. can't walk around with our armor on and shields and swords and say, I don't need no man, you know, as women. So it's, it's somewhere in between. It's the 2.0 version of femininity. And that's something that I'm really like passionate about and talking about, especially in relation to flirting and giving, you know, guys signals, you know, that that's another thing in that first phase that I think is, is really different nowadays is that women are being more reactive when it comes to flirting, then proactive, meaning they'll wait to see if they are attracted to the man in order to turn it on, or they don't want to give the wrong impression or whatever it is that's in their head, rather than just having fun, being open and creating it from within. It goes back to what you said. It's all about what you create and, and, and yourself. And from there, so much magic happens. So thank well, you. Do we have more time? That are we want to? Oh yeah, we can time? take a couple minutes. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So you hit a a big button there. I love what you just said about proactive versus reactive, hmm. and uh, approaching the man you're you're you feel sexually ignited by. Now this is really key. Now what I hear from women, and I found this out in therapy, is that women would come to me a lot and say, "Why is it you know that these guys I get attracted to the wrong guys?" 
the guys who are really yes. a one night stand or he's there yes. and he's not, or the dangerous guy or the guy who's already married or the guy, basically the not available guy. And women do have this sort of radar that goes in and goes, is this man available to me or not? And dependent upon her level of self-esteem, if she has low self-esteem due to a lack of bonding with her father, doesn't mean she has it everywhere, but due to some low self-esteem where she doesn't know that she is totally desirable to a man and she doesn't have to earn his love. Okay, so mm-hmm. if there's a part of her that feels I have to earn a man's love, also because she may, maybe she didn't see her mother get that kind of love from a man. Mm-hmm. See, the, the, the whole idea is that it's a revelation for, you know, for women to get that they don't have to earn love. <laughs> Men do. <laughs> and, and I know that that yeah. doesn't sound all spiritual, but that is the reality. I want to earn the love I get. And, yeah. and the, the, the flip side of that is don't punish me when I'm not good enough. Just don't give me more love when I'm not good enough. Okay. That, there's a, that's yeah. the enlightened part of it is, you know, the punishment. If you're good, you get love. If you're not good, you don't. No, there should be kind of like, if you're gooder, you get more. <laughs> but you always get my love, but you get more more love if you do the right things. And for women, they should know inside that they're the jewel that the man is just the setting for. The man wants to please you. He wants to be there for you. You deserve his love. You don't have to earn his love. But you can also, the problem is you end up pushing his love out. That's the problem for women is that they end up misinterpreting, misunderstanding, and just think, oh, I can't trust him. I have to push him away. So that's the challenge for women is to try to change men or push them away to give up that. And when you feel that I am, I have it. But anyway, coming back to the point, when she has that challenge, Mm -hmm. then what happens is she'll see a man and she'll be turned on right away. And that's called getting, starting a relationship from the genitals, and then finally have it go up. That, <laughs> that's, that's the right direction for men. A man scans the room and says, could I, could I, could I? No, no, no. Yes, I yeah. could. It's, that's an immediate understanding. He's got a radar that says, yes, there's sexual, there's a possibility for sex. Then he's going to make his move. Next thing for women, when, and then eventually if he gets to know her, this is why women should talk more on the date. Mm-hmm. He needs to, he needs to know her so she can be authentically real in a positive way, not authentically real in a negative way. Okay. Not like, you know, dump on your ex or something like that. Right. Right. <laughs> but, but be authentic, authentic, having your own opinions, your own thoughts. Don't adapt, adapt yourself to please him, but be real and enjoy yourself being with him. So if you can be yourself and he's still turned on to you, that's a good sign. You don't want to hide who you are to get him to stay turned on to you because what will happen is he'll feel this sexual attraction. The energy will start to move up to his heart. And as he gets to know you, can he still maintain the sexual attraction as he gets to go up to his head and connect with you intellectually? Can he sustain the sexual attraction? That's a good sign for a woman. For, that for the man to actually get to the place of bonding with a woman. So many men could have sex with any woman practically who's willing to do it, but then the next day they don't want to see her again because he didn't have any heart connection. So for men, it's healthy to start down south to go north. But for women, they start north if quite often yeah. a healthy way of bonding is you go, that man looks safe. He looks interesting. I'm mm-hmm. curious. I like to know what he thinks as opposed to I like to have sex with him. It starts there. Then he has to do things to win your love and affection. You don't give it right away. You don't feel this, I'm in love with him right away. That's often an illusion based upon low self-esteem. So start with the men that you're not totally attracted to if you have a pattern of being attracted to the wrong men. It could be that you just happen to have all three things light up at the same time. You hear him, you find him intellectually compatible, emotionally, he's really right there for you and he's available to you, and sexually you're turned on. But quite often, women can easily be turned on to the wrong guy by fantasy. By the way, and I just want to, anybody who's listening who has that kind of pattern of attracting unavailable or narcissistic or man children, whatever you label it, is that what you just said is actually the key to cracking the code to that because I find that there's a high correlation with women who don't express their feelings, don't create an emotional chemistry and rely on either the sexual chemistry or, you know, of of kind of the toxic ones that go really fast. I call them tornado 
interactions. Or they're not saying anything about themselves and they're just sitting there being a good audience and then get mad later on when they find out that the guy is nowhere for them. And so the best way to crack that code is exactly what you're saying is showing up, sharing something about yourself, you know, creating that emotional connection and knowing that there's these differences between men and women. And I think we'll be okay. So I love this. So we we can bond uh, just... what I love about the dating idea of Mars Venus that sort yeah. of that flips people around is that women often think to be to be a good person on a date, you should ask lots of questions and show interest. And my response to that is it's the wrong direction. Oh what, yes. What what men need to do is ask lots of questions, show mm-hmm. interest, and understand and experience more her. It's literally like he needs to penetrate into her. She needs to open up and be penetrated emotionally. And mentally. Ooh, <laughs> I love that metaphor for sex. That's great. Yeah, I mean, it's it's yeah. there. It is. It's Mars there and it Venus. Is. And so women are hesitant, afraid of, you know, there's there's sort of a cliche where men will make fun of women and say, oh, she talks so much, she talks so much. But that's superficial talk. It, mm-hmm. it, you know, that's when you're on a date, just my my sense is show less interest in him so he can be more interested in you. Be authentic. And here I'm a guy, but, you know, I have a female side, a sensitive side. So I'm going to just give my showing insecurity on my own part, which you, you want to overcome on a date if you're a woman. So I'm with a group of four people and they're all new and I want to impress them. And somebody says, oh, did you see this movie, XYZ movie? What did you think of it? Well, suddenly I'm afraid to say what I think because maybe I didn't like it and everybody else did. And so I say, well, what did you think? Rather than say what I think, because I'm afraid that I will not be seen in a positive light. That is how women unknowingly sabotage their ability Mm. to know if their guy is right for them, to hook up with the right guy, or to build bonding with the right guy, which is to have a different point of view, but without demanding that he have the same point of view. So be authentic in expressing your ideas, your opinions about things, and just say, what do you think about that? And then let him disagree with you and go, well, that, here's three good walk away phrases to use on a date with a guy is you express your point of view on something. He expresses his point of view on something. And if he disagrees with you, you always just say something. Well, that's a good idea. Well, well, I can see why that makes sense. Tell me more about that. Well, you know, I think you're right. You're right. Good idea. That Mm -hmm. makes sense. Mm -hmm. These are, I call them emotional buffers. They will soften a man to be able to hear you more because they pump him up. And But the key to it, the whole thing is you might have to ask a few questions of a guy. Women tend to be very adept at asking questions in a conversation. And actually what that is, it's avoiding sharing what you think and feel, testing if it's safe to express what you think and feel, when the truth is you're basically, you basically, you want to test him out to see if he really can be there for you. You don't want to hide yourself. You want to literally ask a question, maybe he talks a little bit and say, well, that makes sense. And then talk two or three times longer about what you think. You don't Uh, have to seek agreement, seek authenticity without reactivity, trying to change someone, making them wrong. But instead going, when you feel like you don't agree, you can always say, well, that makes sense. Or I, you know, I never thought of it that way. That's one, certainly one good point of view. And then come into your own point of view. You, you want to create difference, again, difference, 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 if you are different, where you are different. And that's good. We can't all be the same. That, that, that's an interesting point. I see where you're coming from. No, I'm just kidding. I know that is, that's awesome. I love, I call it shape shifting. A lot of people like shape into something that they think the other person wants to hear versus their true authentic self. And that is also a recipe for disaster. So these are such golden nuggets. And I, I'm, I'm so grateful to you that you shared all of this here. And I think it's going to help a lot because, you know, I hear my clients, how it gets panned out is that they hear all these big buzzwords, like just create attraction or create vulnerability or authenticity, but they don't know really what that means. And the things that you are giving are such like tangible things that people can try that I really thank you for that. Are there any other parting words of wisdom that you wanted to share? I wish I could just keep going on with you. (laughs) (laughs) Now this is really, again, it's a like men do not want to hear me say this and yeah. it, it may not always be appropriate in every situation, 
but we we've sort of had a theme today about how making sure a man earns your love. Yeah. And uh, of course, to a man, the greatest loving thing a woman can do for him is have sex with him. Uh, so <laughs> if if you're if you're having sex for him, it's too soon. If you're having sex for you, then it's going to be all right. Sex should always be for you. If you do it as a gift to him, so you're not you know you're, you're kind of like in, not in the mood, but you do it for him. That's one thing which I suggest not to do. Mm-hmm. Second one is you're feeling insecure and your power is in being sexual and giving to him. And you know, you can win him yeah. over with it, but really you don't feel like he, if you do a little soul searching, you're doing it to win him over, not because he's won you over. These are subtleties, but if you have sex for him, he will lose interest in you. It comes back to the same thing of giving more than he gives to you and he will give less and less. So don't always be in a rush to have sex with a man. And having said that, we're in such a climate where if if you're attracted to someone, you're supposed to have sex in some cases. At least there's an expectation on many men's part because other women are willing to give it away for free. What's Mm -hmm. wrong with you? Or he could feel like, oh, I guess I'm a real loser to you, so you don't want to do it. And he gets his feelings hurt. A lot of these things, it's complicated. But Basically, you decide you don't want to have sex with him, but you're interested in him. You want to let him earn your love more. There's always going slow. And when you go slow, say you're making out, you're kissing, he's touching, he's feeling really hot and exciting, but you know, you feel like you don't want to go any further. How do you say no uh, when, without these guys being so hurt and giving up or whatever, feeling dejected? Mm-hmm. A, a nice little phrase this is just a helpful phrase in certain situations, which is, oh my gosh, I'd love to go further. I just need to go slow. And he says, what? Uh, what? And then you say, oh, certainly there's a part of me that would love to do more, but I've learned in my experience, I need to go slow. And he goes, what? And you say, yeah, I'd love to have sex with you, but I'm not ready yet. So these are the, these little phrases to say a man, you want to have sex with him, but you need to go slow. Uh, he doesn't fully understand it, but what he does here is that you want to have sex with him And you wanting to have sex with him is actually more potent than actually having sex with him. Ah, that is so, that is so good. That is so good. And along with that, as my closing note is then make sure when you do show up in sexy lingerie or naked with Chinese food, you mean it and that you want to, you want it, (laughs) right? It's it's for you. It's for you. And you you, you delight in being sexy, knowing that he wants to kneel before you. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Awesome. Oh my gosh. Thank you so, so much for joining us today. It was great. This has been the Charisma Quotient. And of course, I'm your host, Kim Seltzer. And remember, you can build confidence, make connections, and find love from the outside in. And if you want to know more about me, of course, you can go to my site, seltzerstyle.com and definitely make sure you check out at least one, if not all of John's amazing books, especially his newest one, Beyond Mars and Venus, and the one that we kind of discussed, Mars and Venus on a Date, where he dives deeper into his dating phases. And if you're looking to deepen and strengthen your dating skills, y'all, you have got to sign up for a free breakthrough call with me. And you can book it right here by clicking on the link in the show description. One call could change your perspective, your outlook, and get you the results. So stay tuned until next week with more tips on how to feel and look fabulous every day. 